Richard Varonk had become a star in France since wearing the leader's yellow jersey in the 1992 Tour de France at the age of 23. He progressed both his climbing skills and chemical mixtures over the following seasons to such an extent that by 1996 he had climbed the podium in Paris as third in the Tour and won three red and white polka dot jerseys as king of the mountains for the infamous Festina team. He was Richard Lionheart, the brave climber, who also knew how to be friendly with the press and the fans, an idol of the masses. However, for 1997, the most doped watchmaking team in history carried out a bizarre campaign focused on one single objective, to win the Tour de France with the most beloved Frenchman, the man who enjoyed gesturing at a camera while a teammate had died. Our protagonist today Richard Varonk. Do you want to know about the crazy 97 Tour de France of the Festina team? Without further ado, let the show begin. Believe it or not, during the 94 to 96 seasons, Varonk was a very competitive cyclist all over the calendar. And although his main victories were in stages of the Tour de France, he usually competed well, especially in his own country's races. He was also a regular top finisher in major competitions, with a 6th in the World Championships and a 5th at the Atlanta 96 Olympic Games. But by 1997, Festina decided to hide the impressive fireworks that they were counting on, and put their fetish cyclist, Richard Varonk, in a deep, dark cave. Although he appeared in numerous competitions on the calendar, it seemed that the Festina team wanted to copy the stealth preparation of Bjarn Reis and the telecom team of the 1996 season, saving the best cartridges exclusively for the tour. Not even in the Dauphiné, Varonk decided to go on the attack, finishing in a discreet 17th position. The excuse on this occasion was a problem with his teeth, as happened to Pieter Ugramov before he mutated into the total cyclist of the 1994 Tour de France. Poor thing. Varonk was like the wolf in the children's story, Little Red Riding Hood. He seemed nice and affable with his cries in front of the cameras, but in reality, he was ready to bite in that edition of the tour. And yet, our bluffing friend got off to a sluggish start. In the Rouen prologue, Dressed in the King of the Mountains jersey, he could only finish 134th in a discipline that, if it wasn't his favourite, left him in a very bad place, having finished behind climbers such as Marco Pantani and Fernando Escartin. But the Festina team and Varonk soon began to get going, just a little after the Telecom team, who on the third stage achieved their first of five victories in that Tour de France on the wall of Plumenek, a classic finish in Brittany in which the German, Eric Zabel, took advantage of his more than doped preparation to beat Frankie Vandenbroek and his teammate, the mutant Bjarne Aris, in that first uphill finish. Of course, Richard Varonk and Laurent Dufault, the two best riders of that Festina team, arrived in the leading group, and while they kept it quiet during the following flat stages, they prepared to show their true level in the first mountain stages of the Pyrenees. Between Po and Ludonville was a light touch. Despite the Col de Soler, the Col de Tourmalet, the Col d'Aspin and the Val d'Aron Lazette, an impressive mountain raid that promised all kinds of explosions, but that remained a small spark because of one man, Bjarne Aris. The then reigning tour champion did not have the strength of the previous two years in his legs and the blood transfusions were not as noticeable in his lumpy, unfaithful bald head as a year earlier in Hauticam. His teammate, Jan Ulrich, far fitter than him, was whistling up all the Pyrenean calls, and it seemed like he wanted to pick up the pace. He would easily unhook the Dane, just as if he were the modern day Christopher Froome. It was the first Vecina show. Ahead in the breakaway was the Frenchman, Laurent Brochard. A fan of marsupials who we knew wasn't a terrible climber, but who that day was climbing as if the ghost of Tommy Vauclair's future from 2011 was entering his body and making him pedal faster and faster. 
His compatriot, Varonk, was the first of the favourites to put Bjarne Rhys to the test. And boy did he succeed. Quickly, Mr. Sixty was losing metres. And Varonk's incredible legs, now recovered from the dental pain, could only be followed by two riders. On one side, with difficulties, was Marco Pantani. And on the other, whistling like one of the kids from Stranger Things, the son of Rudicus in his German champion's jersey. The three of them caught Brochard before the summit, and on the technical descent, their leader, Richard Varonk, ordered him to attack for the prize of the day. He'd done it. The guy who looked like Axel Rose coming out of retirement sang Welcome to the Jungle, because the Festina show had started, right there and then, with Varonk second at the finish line. The next day, it's true that the Festina team couldn't beat the real monster of that edition or as they called him in France, the patron saint. Ole attacked at the base of Ardino Arcalis, a steep mountain in Andorra, and literally crushed the rest of his rivals in the greatest climbing display of his career. At over 570 watts, the telecom rider left behind Varonk, who was still climbing at the pace of the Elefantino Pantani, and another Festina man, Switzerland's Laurent Dufault who was following the wheel of the ineffable Bjarne Rees. The tour had become a telecom festina duel and where the Germans were winning and they took their biggest advantage the next day in the long time trial of San Etienne. There Ulrich won again and not just in any old way. Already in the leader's yellow jersey he pulled more than three minutes ahead of the second place Varonk who had not even made it into the top 100 in the prologue. The difference is that now, the Frenchman, already in his red and white polka dot jersey, was able to follow the German's wheel when he overtook him with 8 kilometers to go. A sign that the chemistry of Bruno Roussel's team was working. Although, they would save the best for last. In between, Ferranc would suffer yet another day. In that Tour de France, all the important stages were consecutive, and after that time trial, came the Alps. A finish that no less than Alpe d'Huez awaited the riders, who suffered from the tremendous heat of the day. This was no obstacle for Marco Pantani, who beat the record of the climb in his favourite mountain pass, loaded with the best EPO on the market, and with a recovery already marked by his pedalling and his facial expression. Ulrich tried to follow him, unsuccessfully and with only a few kilometres to go to the top. But of the three great protagonists of that tour, Varonk was the one who came off worst in third place, suffering like a dog from Pantani's attacks. Nevertheless, he was still the favourite for the French fans, despite losing seven minutes to Ulrich in the GC. As if they knew that the Festina team was literally going to destroy everyone in the following stages. So, the next day, the shortest stage on the tour, but with three colossal climbs like the Glandon, the Madeleine and Courchevel in between, the Festina team decided to show the colour of the load that Willy Vogt was carrying, disobeying their director Roussel, with whom they did not have a good relationship. Leaders Pascal Hervé and Richard Varonk put the rest of the team to work at a hellish pace. The not at all suspicious Bortolami, Stevens, Roux, Brochard, Moreau and Dufault worked alongside the two Frenchmen and broke the peloton to pieces on the Glandon, leaving it in a small select group. Veronque, Brochard, Hervé and Dufault crested the pass with Francesco Casagrande and Jan Ulrich in the lead and decided to launch themselves on the descent. There the leader misdrew a corner and the Festinas escaped alone on the Madeleine. Ulrich was lucky that day that Rhys had hit the right blood bag and he worked like the best of Gregarios to bring the young red-headed man closer to Varonk's group. In the end, the top two in the general classification were in the lead, with everyone else a long way behind and it was all to play for in Courchevel. There we saw what Varonk was like. He wasn't a champion, he was just a kid with a craving for the limelight. He could not leave Ulrich behind at any time, despite the efforts of his teammates. And finally, 
as director Roussel told us years later. Ferranc agreed with Ulrich to buy the stage, in exchange for 15,000 euro, that we imagine the German would spend on his fondness for women and alcohol months later. The lion's heart was already a filthy rat's heart, and although he celebrated the triumph with his characteristic raised finger, his triumph has no value for cycling lovers. But that was not the end of his quest to win the Tour de France by any means necessary. The telecom duo of Ulrich and especially Bjarne Arys had not been happy with their drug cocktail and suffered major stomach problems and suffered badly the next two days, with Pantani and the Frenchman Christophe Mongeon taking victories. Veronque remained in the top five in the mountain stages and there was only one last mountain assault left. The fifth in five days in a row, and the seventh in the last nine days. The French Vosges mountains were faced, and after numerous block attacks by Festina, Ulrich was finally unhooked, more than 80 kilometers from the finish at the Ballon d'Alsace. Veronque had two teammates with him, his compatriots Didier Roux and the dangerous doped Pascal Hervé. In addition, the rest of the tour contenders, like Abraham Olano, Francesco Casagrande or Fernando Escartin were with the Festina group. Uli had no companion and the gap was already over a minute, undoubtedly the key moment of the tour. The only thing that the Festina team had to do was work and reach alliances with the rest of the escapees interested in leaving Ulrich behind. But the weeping Veronk didn't do it. Why? According to his director Roussel, the stingy Veronk offered his rivals Olano and Pantani as little as 1600 euros to help him do the job. Granted, he had a lot of ground to make up on Ulrich, but the terrain no longer had any major mountainous difficulties along the way, and the relays could cut the entire gap to the German with 73 kilometers to go. Ridiculous figures compared to what he had paid Ulrich for a single stage. Is a stage worth more than a tour? Did the differences between Veronque and his director make the deal impossible? Or was it the supposedly brave but cowardly character of the Frenchman that prevented him from taking the Grand Boucle? Veronque kept making gestures and fussing because his breakaway companions wouldn't work with him in exchange for that derisory financial sum. He decided to send his teammates ahead and Roussel was so angry that minutes later he ordered them to stop. It was an appalling ridicule that ended with the group being absorbed by Ulrich's group a few minutes later. The Festina team were so well loaded with their EPO vials that Neil Stevens still won that stage, and the following day Didier Roux won another one with Hervé in second place. Veronk had finished second in that Tour de France, was almost 10 minutes behind Ulrich and having missed his chance to win by not knowing how to buy his rivals. The weeping Veronk claimed that he was innocent, that he had never doped a year later in the Festina affair. But in the end, we all knew that like so many others, Veronk was a lie. A snivelling lie, that not even with all the gold in the world could he win a Tour de France. <laughs>